Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,209. The opportunities come, the situations appear, you always have to be ready to do it, so you just never ever give up on what you're doing. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I'm revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest calling in all the way from Mount Kisco, New York, Randy Elber. Randy, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? Absolutely. Looking forward to it. All right. Randy Elber is the owner of R&R Auto Restorations in Mount Kisco, New York, where their mantra is preservation, restoration, and service. There, he and his business partner, Robert Torre, worked on a variety of exotic marks, including Ferrari, Lamborghini, Alfa Romeo, Porsche, Mercedes, and Aston Martin, just to name a few. Randy's love of cars began when he was just 13 and purchased a Pontiac Le Mans that he promptly restored into a GTO clone just shy of his 17th birthday. How cool is that? Randy majored in automotive restoration at the infamous McPherson College, wonderful place in Kansas, great place to get an education where he earned scholarships from Mercedes-Benz and Haggerty Insurance. After graduating with honors, he was hired at Paul Russell & Company, another incredible restoration shop, where he further honed his craft. A chance meeting over a Mercedes 300 SL Roadster brought Randy together with his future business partner, Robert, and today they are preserving a beautiful 1955 Mercedes going that they found had been actually sitting since 1974, one of those magic barn finds. So, Randy, I've told our listeners just a little bit about you. Would you take a brief moment and share a little bit more before I jump into the questions about your business and a very obvious passion for restoring automobiles? Yes, thank you. Um, you know, we are uh, very fortunate to, to be able to open the shop and, and have the opportunity to finally, you know, be on my own and focused very much on the preservation restoration service. You know, we have that as a mantra and our main focus is really just, you know, honoring the, the original craftsmen. And the integrity and the in the history behind you know a lot of these cars. Um, that's what always you know drove me and continues to drive me. My main interest in doing this. So you know this uh, shop really is kind of an embodiment of what I like to do, what I've been passionate about doing, and you know thankful enough we're we're now here and and uh, the doors are open. It's fantastic. You know I think it's great. The journey that you've had has been pretty darn cool. Kind of a dream come true as I am learning more about you and. To be able to start off at McPherson, I had Amanda Gutierrez, who's a VP there, uh, yeah. on the show not too long ago. Wonderful lady. She's introduced me to some really cool people uh, at the college, and I got a chance to have uh, a breakfast with some of their students when I was at Pebble Beach during the uh, car week last summer, which was really fun. As we continue on your journey, I, I always like to start with a success quote or a mantra. I mentioned your company mantra at the beginning. Maybe you could elaborate on that, but this needs to be some kind of thing that is successful or helps you form a successful business, I should say. It's a nice way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars Yeah. So, Randy, take the wheel. I have two, uh, you know, I really, I enjoy quotes. You know, it's always kind of like a, just a quick, you know, note from somebody you either successful in their own right that kind of gives you a little, you know, a little kick or a little inspiration. There's two I always thought was funny. FDR had a really good quote amongst, you know, hundreds of really great quotes, but he said, uh, when you come to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. (laughs) And, you know, I always interpreted that as, you know, you just never give up. You know, my journey certainly has been a little bit all over the place, you know, back and forth across the country, you know, moving around and, you know, starting as a, as a teen, basically knowing nothing and having no money, you know, I scrapped everything I had together to purchase that car. And, and, you know, kind of following that quote, you know, throughout my career is just, you know, just when you get, to the end, or you think, you know, maybe you can't do it, or you got to push a little bit more, you know, you just never, ever give up on it, because the, the opportunities come, the situations appear, you always have to be ready to do it. So you just never, ever give up on what you're doing. Absolutely. Never, ever give up. That's another famous quote, Sir Winston Churchill. Uh, he probably said it more eloquently than I just did. But uh, yeah, you're, that's right. I hear that, especially from race car drivers, but very, very true with entrepreneurs. It's, it's kind of like that visual I've seen where you're digging for gold and you're just three axe picks away from hitting the vein and then you quit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not quite there. So 
Yeah, you just got to stick with it and have faith. And uh, I tell you, you know, you've been very fortunate because uh, going to McPherson and then getting some scholarships from Mercedes and, of course, Haggerty. I had McKeel Haggerty on the show here. Uh, wonderful company, great people. And then, of course, getting to jump out of school and go to work at Paul Russell. Uh, Alex Finnegan was a guest here on the show, and Paul has promised to be a guest, too. Uh, we'll just got to get him on here. I know he's busy and maybe a little shy, but uh, incredible company that companies that you've been involved with, which is really, really cool. Let's talk about a story that instigated your passion for cars, though. You know, I talked about that Pontiac Le Mans that you turned into a GTO, but is there a pivotal moment, as you can call it? Maybe it's going further back, or maybe it's that, that you knew you were going to be a car guy for life. I think, uh, you know, when I first had gotten that car on the road, which took four years, not for lack of effort, you know, for for lack of funds. Yeah, um, sure. It was such a journey to finally get that, you know, to just, just go down the road, and it was it was bare bones. You know, there's no interior, no carpet. Seats were partially bolted in, but but it did its thing. You know, I just loved it. And I really, especially kind of in my high school years, I played sports and, you know, I was kind of involved in a bunch of different things, but nothing that I was as passionate about as it was about cars. I think the really the moment that kind of changed it was, you know, kind of coming into your senior year, you know, you're, you're looking at colleges and kind of deciding, okay, you know, what am I going to do? And, you know, you've got every piece of advice and every guidance counselor under the sun. And you really just have to kind of look inside and say, what do I, what do I really want to do? What am I going to, what's going to keep me going for the next 10, 15, 20 years, which at 17, 18 is almost an impossible question to do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I had originally committed to going to Cincinnati for mechanical engineering. And I, what I really wanted to do was cars. And it was um, originally from Cleveland, Ohio. So it was kind of an in-state and, you know, I visited and I was kind of, partially interested and not really excited. And, you know, all my free time and all my funds were all, you know, tied up in, you know, my car. So it was looking for that. And and just on a whim, there was a really tiny article, which I have since cut out and framed with me here in the shop about Jay Leno donating money to a restoration school in Kansas. You know, my mom shows it to me and says, have you seen this? And I said, no, I haven't. I have no idea. You know, so we're like instantly you know, on there, pulling up the website, looking through the photos of the restoration program. And I just, I, I didn't even, I filled out, I think that night, every piece of information I could to fill out for applying and then created a portfolio. And I committed to going and signed up before I'd even visited and had probably more than a 10 minute phone conversation with anybody out there. Cause it just, it, it just struck you when you, when you saw it, you're like, this is what I want to do. You know, yeah. it was automotive restoration. It was vintage cars. It was, you know, the whole, the whole gamut of learning how to do this. And it was at that point, I said, this is, I was without even seeing it. I knew I was all in at that point. I'm like, I, I'm cars are going to be with me for the rest of my life. Yeah. Wow. What a fortuitous thing to find. And I, I wasn't aware of McPherson uh, until years ago when I encountered, I think it was a student that had gone there when I learned more about it. When I started doing my podcast, I really wanted to learn more about it. And uh, I mentioned Amanda, and I'm going to have the president of the company, our president of the school, I should say, um, the dean, I guess they call him, <laughs> on yeah. the show this year as well. I got, uh, I had a chance to have breakfast with him when, during Car Week, which was great, and learn more about the school. It's absolutely fantastic. And companies like Haggerty Mercedes that do scholarships to help students along the way, uh, absolutely fabulous companies to support what you guys are doing. And for students who you, most students, like me, when I went into college, I had a couple nickels in my pocket. So uh, it was kind of tough. You know, I had to wax a lot of cars to pay my tuition or my, my quarterly fees every every quarter. So uh, it's fantastic that these companies step up. Kudos to them. Well, let's take a look at some of the roads you've driven down and talk about a big challenge or a big failure because you're an entrepreneur. So no doubt you've run up <laughs> against a few challenges from time to time. Uh, maybe mention one of those. Kind of walk us through that experience and tell us how it helped you gain even more momentum as you move forward in your business. You know, I had relocated down to White Plains, New York. We had a, a long distance relationship that couldn't really be managed long distance anymore, which meant, um, you know, one of us had to move and that had to be me. Yeah. So, you know, relocating down to the area with always, you know, in the back of your mind about, you know, wanting to kind of have your own place and sort of do it, you know, the way you've always sort of envisioned it. The challenge was to have that, take that from just an idea to all the nuts and bolts of the business plan and the financing and the structure of the business. And, you know, really, as it as it kind of went along, you know, I spent a few years with automotive restorations in Stratford, Connecticut. You know, I since had left there, worked for a private 
collection up in Newport, Rhode Island. And, you know, and as you move through these things, you know, that idea kept just growing and growing for me and so did our family. So, which kind of meant, you know, us back here. And, and once we really landed here, you know, all signs pointed to, to open in the shop and it's just to look at it, you know, at the very first, you know, one, two or three steps, it's monumental. You know, I had uh, one daughter and, and since we were, since we'd opened, we've had our second. So the family growing and the responsibilities at home, large and same with your, uh, from a personal level and a professional level, you know, to develop that idea and do it. I mean, that the, the challenge in that was, was just, it was huge. And, you know, like anything, you just have to bite it off in, in sections you can chew. So it was a journey to say the least, you know, years. I, I really felt like it was really years in the making as far as, you know, getting the idea, deciding how you want it to look, you know, developing the business plan, you know, doing all the finances and really getting that, you know, kind of squared away to really, you know, then you then you could start to see it happen. You know, once you accomplish a few steps, you know, it became clear how to do the next three. And then you got those done and it kind of just grew and grew, you know, to the point where really I had everything I thought, you know, I needed and and also personally felt like I was ready to do it. Exactly. You know, this is a really key thing. And I hear this from a lot of people who want to start a business, no matter what it is. But when you talk about a restoration business, you got some pretty physical requirements there as far as a facility, equipment, uh, insurance, uh, all the, you know, business licenses. I mean, all these things that people don't think about, they go, oh, I'm just going to open a shop. And uh, then when you start hiring people, there's a whole other level of responsibility there that happens with not only uh, reporting to the IRS, but, uh, you know, payroll and I mean, all these different pieces. So what's a what's a, a couple or maybe just one great piece of advice you might offer somebody? You kind of touched on it there. You know, I always say, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a what time. One bite at a time. Yeah. But if, if, if I was a young man saying, hey, man, I want to open my restoration shop out here at Gig Harbor, Washington. Uh, aside from saying run away <laughs> or, be, or be very careful, young man, uh, what would you tell me as far as uh, how to plan that out so I, I don't trip over some of the things that you might have tripped over because someone didn't tell you what to do? Yeah, you know, there's no, there's every bit of information, you know, out there as far as, you know, for, for helping aids, but there's really no like straight guidebook to say, this is how your business should look. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. It's up to you. And, you know, that was certainly pretty intimidating at first to say, okay, this is all you know, basically my decisions and how I want it to go. But, you know, the one piece of advice I would say is, you know, do the details. I mean, I, what I always tried to do for, you know, looking at the whole structure of the business and the billing and the invoicing and the insurance and the licenses, I mean, there are, you know, there's countless things you need to structure and think about, but, you know, I, I simply just started with a notebook and an idea, wrote it down and said, okay, and, you know, here's the square footage I think I want to land on based on what I think makes sense for myself and possibly one other guy at a sort of an initial stage. So, you know, I decided, okay, I, you know, when I first start, I would like to, in a perfect world, I want to be able to kind of pick and choose the cars and clients I work for. So I don't want to be in a large building that is, you know, too, with a financial overhead that would just bury me, you know, initially. Right. Um, that is main focus was, say, okay, I want the business to focus on, you know, the quality of work you know, working for really like great clients. So I don't want to have to go out and get 30 new clients. I'd like to get one, two, or possibly three. So, okay, yeah. this is, there you go. that necessitates, you know, this square footage. I need, you know, two lifts and just really just mentally, I would walk myself through the day. I would say, okay, I'm going to need an airline. So, okay, I need to do a compressor. I need to, you know, come up with an air system, an airline, how many air hoses, how many lifts am I going to run? Do I need heavily electrical? I'm going to have to have a welder or, you know, and it, you just sort of just walked yourself through how you're going to function throughout the day in your business, you know, envisioning, you know, what you would expect as a normal restoration, what tasks you're going to run into. Okay. I need this equipment or these tools or this kind of bench space or this many vice. And it sounds like a little bit of a minutia, but it kind of helps you just envision like how you function throughout your day and in right. your shop yeah. makes you think about like, Okay, for instance, um, I need to throw the trash out. Where does the trash go? Where, got, yeah, well, you know, I've got the, uh, yeah. you know, I've I just <laughs> emptied the oil and coolant out of this car. How am I going to dispose of it? You know, it's all those little things, you know, that kind of just help you shape up the days to say, okay, here's all the stuff I need, and that that kind of helps shape the shop end of things. And then, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, truthfully, I looked on a lot of the government funded small business pages as far as advice and financing and stuff because the nature of the restoration business you know we we essentially sell labor 
So it's labor and parts. So there's a lot of tools out there that kind of help you sort of structure that end of things. Plus, you know, the McPherson did a great job of kind of giving you the business sort of mindset of, you know, although you can do great work, that doesn't mean you can, you got to be able to communicate it, bill for it properly. You know, that's, it's really two, two parts. Oh yeah, absolutely. So what I heard out of this is create a plan and then work that plan. Yeah. And you just start, I mean, like I said, you have to start at the bottom. A good piece of advice I had was just no details too small, you know, and you just work it out there and, and always, and for me, it's funny, I consider myself still somewhat young, but you know, I'm in the old school version. I, I literally wrote it all down and I would carry my notebook with me. A smart man. To, and anywhere I was going, if I, you know, happened to be at lunch or at something else and I said, oh, you know, that I forgot about uh, adding, you know, do I need a rack to add? Uh, steel material for when I'm fabricating stuff, and I would write that down. And you know, as it as it kind of go, not trying to put you know too much of a time frame on yourself. You just you know you get enough things down. You say, I think I got a good grasp on you know what I need to what this is going to look like to open. And that's kind of it. Just sort of it moves a little more organically than you than you think it is once you kind of get you know just pushing that the initial push to get going is is the hard part. Absolutely, I always tell people too, like you suggested. Reach out for help. Find mentors. Um, you you had a great example right out of school working at Paul Russell. I mean, you went right to the top. So to to see how a company like that, and I, I guarantee you, when that company started way way back when, they weren't what they are now. They didn't have all that equipment. They didn't have a nice facility. Uh, I've had many people in the shop or on the show here that uh, started in very humble beginnings, and it took a lot of time. There are no overnight successes in this business. And it's easy to, or it's hard to walk into, let's say, Bruce Canapa's shop uh, and go, whoa, how, how do I get to this level? Because he wasn't always at that level. It took many, many years and a lot of hard work. So uh, great advice there. Now, let's have a little bit of fun and talk about your first really special vehicle. We may have already covered this with that GTO, or maybe there's another first really special vehicle or a first really special car you restored. I know there's a story there somewhere. My first special car would definitely be the the 68 Le Mans. I mean, that really sparked, you know, the start. I, I would have to say, I think on a better story, I think as a, you know, as a kid, I mean, I started with um, Paul when I was 19, you know, a lot of service work, you know, a lot of component restoration work. And, you know, my first full real top to bottom restoration that I was part of the team on was um, in LA going and incredibly special car, very cool story. You know, in the car, the project was was very challenging. Mostly, a car had mostly been apart, led a really hard life. So not really a nice, you know, what you would hope for is kind of like a nice kind of worn out car that you could, you know, you were bringing back. It was a car that was, you know, teetering on the, you know, too far gone to to come backstage. And, you know, to be a part of, I mean, we had a, there's still is an incredible amount of talent up there. But, you know, I, I was fortunate to be crew chief on that project, work some incredibly talented guys and to really get through that whole process and see that at the, at the finish line and, and just a chance to just go down the road, you know, that, that really, you know, that that's at the end of the day, that it still is the most enjoyable part of doing this is just getting in the seat and saying, you know, we brought this car back from, you know, from wherever it was dilapidated state and have it be the representation, what it should be, you know, every bit of what it was when it was new and just go down the road. And it was just that, you know, that point, that car always, you know, always holds a little special place because it was just, uh, you know, at that point, at that completion stage, I, even even working through it, saying this is, it, it was it was certainly tough, you know, but to get to get through it and and be really excited about how it was done at the end and be able to chance to just sit back and kind of just walk around it, that car will always hold a, hold a special place for me. Very rewarding indeed. Is there a vehicle you've owned that you've let go that you wish you had back? Yeah, I, you know, I reluctantly had to sell my Le Mans in high school, kind of coming into college and trying to get some of that initial money together to, you know, deal with the move and all the costs. You know, I was going from Cleveland to Kansas. I couldn't bring the car with me. I couldn't afford to store it and, you know, frankly needed the money. And and I would love to, it'd probably be a laugh today to see what some of the stuff I had done as a teenager to that car versus (laughs) how I would have treated it today. (laughs) But that car would always, I would always love to have that back. You know, it's always just a reminder that, you know, I, where you started from, you know, I always yeah. think that's a, that's always an important thing to do. You never, you never forget where you started. Absolutely. Yeah. I understand completely. How about what's happening today in this year? We're into the new year here and I'd love for you to share a little bit more with our listeners about your business, r r Auto Restorations, what you guys do there, what kind of services you provide so that Listeners out there that have a, an old special vehicle that they want to have it restored know that uh, you're a shop to think about going to. 
Yeah, we, uh, I mean, we opened in the early part of May of 2018. So, you know, the shop is definitely still somewhat new. You know, one project uh, he, he touched on a little bit earlier that, you know, we're super excited about is uh, this incredibly original um, 55 Gullwing. It's an early production car, really one of the best, I mean, almost a fairy tale written story that it's, you know, a two and or car, been off the road since 1974 and literally untouched other than that. I mean, original interior, original details, original wheel weights. I mean, it just, uh, it's wow. just incredible. You know, it's a rudge wheel car, special order color combination. I mean, you really couldn't, you couldn't script a better, you know, a better story. And really for us uh, here, and you know, that, that car is really a very good kind of indicator for what we aim to do. You know, I think there's a change kind of has been happening and hope continues to happen that there's much more emphasis on original cars and originality and, you know, authenticity behind, you know, the restoration work. And, you know, this car, for instance, provides us the opportunity to save it, you know, kind of display, mm -hmm. you know, our skills. And in person, I think preserving a car is, is much more difficult than a restoration. A restoration, you know, you do the research and you're, you're understanding, okay, what was the original finish? What was the original paints? You know, how did the overspray and how did they finish this you know you have some you know you're working back but essentially you're kind of erasing the you know the the palette and starting over you know in hopes to get it to this best representation of what is original you know in this car for instance so much of that originality is still there there's wax pencil on the front drums that the factory put on to match oh the my front spindles and wow you know, so there's so much restraint and documentation and, and really just a very gentle approach and a lot of respect for what the car still is that, you know, we want to do everything we need to do to basically get it back to the road and, and driving and beat it on every every bit of what it, you know, what it should be without restoring it, without changing anything about it, without erasing its history and sort of just maintain that, you know, appearance and that originality to it. And that's, that's really what we aim to do here. We're, a hundred percent on board with doing restorations, but you know, that's why I kind of, our mantra for the business really is preservation, restoration service, alphabetically it works, but preservation is really what we're looking for first. You know, you know, they kind of go hand in hand. If there was a car that's really original, but for instance, in its wrong color, we would like to preserve what's original on the car and, and on the restoration end of things, maybe paint it to its original finish. So, you know, that's really what we do here started as just myself. Um, now I've, I've uh, one additional employee who I was thrilled to have, who I've known for, for years. Um, so now it's just the two of us in here. And, um, you know, we don't do any exterior, you know, body work or paint. Uh, we don't do upholstery work, kind of the specialty engine machine work on chrome plating. That's all done by vendors. But, you know, all the disassembly, reassembly, all the mechanical rebuild, you know, wiring, all the parts painting. We have a booth here that we set up to do all the parts painting. You know, basically all your all your assembly tasks of the car um, are all done, you know, in house here. So thankfully, also, you know, we've I have some really trusted vendors, uh, upholstery and paint and body that I've been working with for years as well. So really, everything kind of gets managed under here, and you know, the vast majority of the work is done in house. Absolutely, very very cool, uh, very exciting. What's the best way for listeners to uh, reach out to you and learn more about your business? You know, we're, the website is sort of a, a work in progress. You know, we're, uh, consider ourselves a lean entrepreneur. So a lot of the uh, <laughs> website work is getting done, you know, on my, uh, with a family member and, and myself. So we're, um, thankfully we're so busy right now that finding time for that has been, has been difficult, but, uh, the best way, I mean, frankly, would just be to call or email myself, you know, happy to talk about the projects, you know, and I think, you know, the best advice you could get is before you even started, you know, it's, it's getting on the same page, understanding your goals for the car, for what you want to do with the car. That's really the best way to kind of see if, if we're a good fit, you know, frankly, we're not for everybody, but you know, we, uh, we hope that we could. So it's, you know, as discussion is always the best place to start. And secondary to that we have, cause it's, um, just getting it up. We have a Instagram account. Um, it's RR auto resto and that's where we just sort of you know, very easily kind of show, you know, showcase um, some of the stuff that we're, you know, currently doing and, and showing some progress of some of the cars we have going on. So it's a good way to kind of, 
you know, although it's not totally in depth, it's a good way to kind of just see there's some good shots of the shop, some stuff we have currently going on and just sort of, you know, how we like to approach what we do. There you go. Well, I'll make sure I put those uh, communication points on Randy's show notes page on the Cars yeah website. So just go to CarsYeah.com, type in Randy Elber, E-L-B-E-R, and you'll find those right there. So Randy, up next is the last lap. Before we put the pedal to the metal, let's say thank you to today's Cars yeah sponsor. Everyone who knows me knows I'm really picky when it comes to my cars and keeping them looking new. I'm a huge fan of Covercraft floor mats. I've protected my vehicle with their products for decades. Want to keep your vehicle's interior looking new? It's easy with Covercraft floor mats. They will protect your vehicle's factory carpets from daily abuse, weather, pets, children, weekend adventures, and those everyday spills. It's a fast, easy, and stylish way to keep your vehicle looking new. Covercraft floor mats come in a wide variety of styles, materials, and configurations, all designed for maximum protection. In addition to Premier Plush and Berber Custom Floor Mats, you'll also find cargo liners, canine cargo area liners, dash covers, and sunscreens. Enhance your vehicle's looks while protecting the factory finishes with easy-to-install and easy-to-clean floor mats. Covercraft is the right choice. Learn more today at Covercraft.com and tell them Mark at Cars Yeah sent you. That's Covercraft.com. Are you looking for a way to get your products or services into the ears of thousands of automotive enthusiasts around the globe? I can help. This is Mark Green here at Cars Yeah, and I'd be honored to be an influencer and ambassador for your brand in a unique and personal way. Five days a week, Thousands of subscribers and listeners enjoy the Cars Yeah podcast and website. Contact me today and I'll show you how at mark at carsyeah.com or connect with me through the Cars Yeah website at carsyeah.com. Hey, Mark Green here from the Cars Yeah podcast. Did you know you can now see me on the Cars Yeah TV show? That's right. Cars Yeah is now on MAV TV. I visit some of the past Cars Yeah guests and take you along for the ride. Go to MavTV.com to learn more where you can enjoy Cars Yeah TV. Mav TV is also available on DirecTV, Fubo TV, Fios by Verizon, or you can stream it through MavTV.com online. And they said I only had a face for podcasting. Randy, we are back, and I've got a little introspective question for you today. If you were manifested into a car, if you woke up tomorrow and you were a car sitting in your shop, maybe in need of restoration, maybe not, what would you be and why? Oh, I have to laugh at this question. That's That, that, that could be <laughs> incredibly telling for a car guy to fellow car guys. You know, oh, yeah. be a pretty telling car. You know, I've thought about it, and I, I have to tell you, it's a challenge to answer, but being an American, I'd have to pick an American car, and being born in the 80s, I'd say I'd have to pay an 80s car as well. I don't know. I always have a soft spot, and, and it's going to sound ridiculous amongst all the cars we currently have in the shop, but I always loved an IROC Z Camaro. You know, I thought they were just, uh, you know, just had a good personality from from what they were from the 80s. So kind of, you know, I can relate to them, would still secretly really like to have one. And I would say in, in, in a few different versions, you know, it's just uh, maybe with a little bit, a little bit more power than they were, you know, originally, I think would kind of, that would kind of see, I could kind of see myself sort of as that, as that car, T-tops, T-tops in a manual. There you go. Perfect for the eighties. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to venture into the last lap. I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some very quick blips of that IROC throttle. So here we go. What's the best automotive advice or restoration advice you've ever received? No, oh, very simple. Your your standards are the highest. You know, just the standards you held yourself to needs to be higher than anybody else. You okay. know, you're always, if, if you're happy with it, then you know it's the best you can do. There you go. Would you share one of your personal habits you believe has helped contribute to your many successes over the years? Uh, just focus on the details. It, it's really, you know, I, I try to hold that true in a lot of, in the work, you know, specifically, but, you know, communicating to clients, following up, you know, given assessments, you know, the details, you know, really focusing on the details, really crossing your eye, crossing your T's and, uh, and dotting your I's, you know, really help you kind of develop a good plan. And that's always, that's always helped me. Well, in communication, I'm glad you mentioned that word. I think that is absolutely imperative. I've had so many friends restore cars with great shops and maybe not so great shops. And in most cases, it was lack of communication that caused all the problems. Yep. Yeah. Uh, just always communicating with that customer what's happening. How about a resource? Is there one you'd like to share with our listeners that you found really helpful? Um, I, I would say just if I could give a plug to um, McPherson College, you know, I think I think they're a huge, huge resource for the industry. I, I think, you know, starting to have, you know, really bringing up 
you know, that, that's one question you hear constantly, who's going to be doing this in 15 yep. years, 20 years, you know, that the majority of, you know, car collectors or shop owners are, you know, getting older or looking to, you know, move out or retire. And, you know, it's kind of changing. I, I think, you know, there needs, I think they've got a great amount of attention on them now, but I think it's, I think they deserve more, you know, it's trying to get, you know, these, you know, kids and, and people up who are interested in it, you know, and started very much in the way I did just to, to come up through that. Cause that's, that's, what's going to continue to keep these cars going are the people that are, that are interested and going to be involved. Absolutely. Huge shout out to McPherson. And, uh, you can go back on the Cars Yeah website and find my talk with Amanda. I think it's well worth a listen. Uh, we'll make sure also we put a link to their website on Randy's show notes page. Uh, if you could have a drink with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased, who would it be? Uh, I would have to say uh, Rudolf Ullenhout. Ah, as okay. a as a 300 SL, you know, obviously fan and and which is a main focus of our business. A lot of respect for what he did, but you know, following some of his personal life, I mean, his talents were pretty much in almost everything he seemed to seem to get into, you know, his driving skills, his engineering skills, um, you know, the management end of things and kind of what, you know, they are a perspective of, of showing up, you know, with creating the 300 SL out of, you know, right out of World War II. Yeah. I think he could have, would be a pretty inter- interesting person to sit down and have, have a drink with. No doubt. No doubt. Now, how about a book? Is there a book you've read that you think our listeners would enjoy reading? You know, to be, uh, to be a hundred percent honest with, um, Our first daughter is now two and a half and our second daughter is five months old. Every book that I have read in the last few years is all (laughs) baby books. (laughs) Well, I got a tip for you here, Randy. I'm going to have you uh, look up a past three-time Cars Yeah guest, Dwight T. Knowlton. He has written three very cool children's books about cars, the last one being about a father and a daughter and a little silver speedster. So you got to check out Dwight's books. They're absolutely fantastic. I bought them even though my kids are all grown up. Because I thought they were so cool. I think maybe secretly hoping to have some grandchildren someday that I can sit down and read those too. So you got to go check out Dwight T. Knowlton Carpe Viam is his website. And uh, I was going to say Carpe Diem. Carpe Viam sees the road. Uh, And there's some great books for your little girls uh, to enjoy there. Absolutely. You bet. Well, I'll remind our listeners, you can find all these great resources on Randy's show notes page on the Cars Yeah website. All right, Randy, we're up to the last question. This last one can be a bit of a doozy, a car I'm sure you're familiar with. If you could have just one very cool collector car in your garage, what would it be and why? But there's a couple rules to this game that I've got to throw in. One is you can't sell it to buy a bunch of other toys, cars, or machine shop equipment with. (laughs) (laughs) You have to drive it. I don't want a garage queen parked in your garage. I want you to get out there in New York and have some fun. But it's the only collector car you can have. So choose wisely, my friend. Yeah, I mean, it's... If it was five, it would be a lot easier. Of uh, course. Of course. <laughs> Have all five pieces of chocolate, not just one. Right, right. <laughs> uh, if, I, if I had to, I would say uh, I would never, ever be disappointed with a 300 SL I like going. Okay. <laughs> you know, a little, uh, definitely with the luggage in the back. So there's some some utility to it. And you've got a passenger seat, so you can always bring somebody with you. And, you know, being a Mercedes, it would always start. So that would be <laughs> that, that would be my choice. Do you have a color choice that that going would be? Probably black. Oh, wow. I, I've seen, I think, maybe one black one. I, you see a lot of silvers, of course. I've seen yeah. red and, and some beautiful greens and uh, even blues. But I think I've only seen one black one, which it was very stunning. I mean, it's a very sophisticated car. So black works on that car, of course. And, of course, Rudge Wheels. Rudge I'm Wheels, sure black got, Rudge Wheels. Yeah. I'd have to go with the... Uh, <laughs> Green leather with the plaid, green plaid seats. Ooh. That'd be oh, it. man. That'd you're be pain- it. Yeah, you're painting a beautiful picture. Love it. Well, Randy, you've taken me on a great ride today. Really enjoyed getting to know you better. I want to thank you for sharing your journey. I want to thank Sean for connecting us, uh, putting us together here today. Um, is there a little parting piece of wisdom or guidance you could offer before you drive off into the sunset in that black Mercedes 300 SL going? I would definitely say, you know, absolutely never give up. You know, my my journey, which I shared some of this, you know, today, I mean, I, I started at the absolute bottom, you know, as a kid, knowing nothing and, you know, been fortunate enough to just continue to work and never give up on what I wanted to do. And, you know, to get to this stage is just so many incremental steps. There were so many challenges, so many roadblocks, so many forks in the road, you know, throughout the process that, you know, if you didn't have that, you know, kind of determination, I, I wouldn't have got here. And it's easy to 
be at the stage and look back and say, oh, yeah, I got all through that. Of course, in the moment, you know, sometimes you think, how am I going to get through this? But, you know, you just put your head down and you say, this is what I want to do. And you just never, ever, ever give up on it. There you go. Never, ever give up. And again, the best way for our listeners to learn about you. Um, I know we have at Auto Resto, which is your Instagram account, and I'll make sure I put a link to phone number and email so people can reach out and find you. And then you let me know when you get some time uh, on the side to get that uh, website up, right, right. and I'll make sure I add that to your show notes page as well. Well, listeners, again, you can find everything on Randy's show notes page here on CarsShare.com. Randy, thanks for being so generous with your time, your expertise, and for sharing your experiences with our listeners. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you down the road. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. You take care of your cars, but who takes care of your investments? Tune-ups aren't just for engines. Updating your financial plan is important too. Your GPS may take you from A to B, but it won't help you on the road to financial freedom. For that, you need a good co-pilot and a very trusted advisor. Chris Kimball, CFP, is just the man for the job. He'll guide you down that road without driving you crazy. For over 25 years, Chris has helped people just like you and me with their financial planning and investments. With a master's degree in financial services, he is eminently qualified. And he's a car guy, too. Learn more at chrisvkimball.com or call 866-ON-A-PLAN. Securities through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Member FINRA SIPC. CK Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!